Good morning, everyone. Great to be with you today in worship. I want to get one thing clear up top here. We're talking about things that get in the way of the life that we know Christ wants for us, and today's kind of a heavy topic. So last hour is very full in here, and there was a lot of elbowing going on. Uh, because you were taking, they were taking my sermon and preaching it to their neighbor last hour. So I just want to encourage no elbowing this morning and that this sermon might be heard um, for you. Imagine that. Let's begin with an exercise this morning. You're going to see a graph on the screen. And I want you to picture your life as it relates to this graph. 21 blocks of time, and I know there are several times in life something comes up, unexpected things hit, um, <clears throat> especially during the holidays, right? We're overly, excessively busy, but just think about a typical week of your life and plug it in to, to this graph. Think about what that might look like and ask yourself how many from morning, afternoon, and evening, seven days a week, 21 blocks of time, the exact hour breakdown doesn't matter, but, but how many blocks of your week, typical week, are open. Completely free. You don't have any responsibility, anything scheduled. How many blocks are open? And I would argue, and feel free to argue back, because I can't prove this in any way, but I would argue that three is the magical number. Three open blocks. If you have three times out of this week, on a typical week, three means that you might have some sort of margin in your life. Maybe not a ton of free time, right? but you have some sort of healthy rhythm or margin in your life. If you have less than three, you are too busy. You are overly busy. Full transparency, I'm, I did this exercise for my own life and my own family, and I'm going to share with you what I came up with. Here is the Barnetts. So morning uh, consists of workouts, quiet times, getting the kids to school, and then, of course, morning and afternoon, Monday to Thursday, our offices are open. I'm at work. Uh, immediately go from work to uh, being one of the Barnett Uber drivers. <clears throat> Football practice, basketball practice, soccer practice. That's Monday, Tuesday. We usually have family dinner around 8.30, 8.45 at night. Homework, if we even want to do it, starts around 10. Not so serious about that. So um, Wednesday night, typically dinner with somebody in the church. The kids are at church. Friday morning is yard work. Lord Jesus, help us. The leaves are falling. Um, and then maybe, if I'm lucky, a round of golf, nine or 18 holes in the afternoon. Uh, date night in the evening. Saturday is obviously full of games, soccer, basketball, uh, football. My son's now old enough. Football happens during the, the, the week at like 5 o'clock. That's nice. Uh, some sort of party going on on Saturdays. Kids have birthday parties. There's obviously a watch party every Saturday night. Last night we did this. Last night we said, guys, we're not going to do anything tonight because we have to do something. <laughs> you ever do this? We're not going to go out and do anything because we have to do something. There's good football on TV, and we're going to sit in front of the TV and watch it, not, not OU, but other good games. Um, Sunday morning church, Sunday afternoon, those little people, that's our small group who we do life with and love dearly. And then look, Sunday evening, by God's grace, is open. And you know why it's open? It's open so that we can prepare to do it all over again. And all over again. And all over again. So, I hope you're totally okay with the fact that this sermon was written by me and for me. And if it helps any of you today, that's wonderful. One survey says that 60% of adults in the United States said that they feel too busy to enjoy life. To enjoy life. For adults with children under the age of 18, that number went up to 74%. And although the majority of these uh, parents found parenthood to be enjoyable and rewarding, one-third of parents said that they felt rushed all of the time, and half of them said that they feel like their lives are out of balance. H&R Block surveyed thousands of participants and what they discovered is alarming. Listen to this. The average participant claimed to be so busy, they get about, how many hours do you guess they get about per week of free time? Wrong, 30 minutes. The average person said, I feel like I get 30 minutes of free time a week. On average, people are putting off 14 things on their to-do list at all times because they are too behind. 
Only half of them use their paid vacation days, and the ones who do use PTO, 40% of them admit to be working half or more of the time that they are away on vacation. San Diego State University research found that 75% of parents are too busy. Listen, please. 75% of parents claim to be too busy to read to their children at night. In 1987, 1987, 50% of families had family dinners almost daily. In 2008, which was quite a while ago, that figure declined to 20% of families are sitting around the dinner table. We're too busy. We're so busy, our physical health is at risk. Dr. Susan Coven practices internal medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital, and in a Boston Globe column, she wrote this. In the past few years, I've observed an epidemic of sorts, patient after patient, suffering from the same condition. The symptoms of this condition include fatigue, irritability, insomnia, anxiety, headaches, heartburn, bowel disturbances, back pain, and weight gain, There are no blood tests or x-rays diagnostic of this condition, and yet it is easy to recognize the condition as excessive busyness. And here's a good question. Why? Why? Why are we so busy? Busy to the point that we don't have time for the Lord. Why do we do this to ourselves? I understand for millions, billions of people around the world, busyness is a necessity. They have to work multiple jobs to make ends meet, and they have multiple mouths to feed. I understand for many, countless around our world, busyness is a necessity. But what are the other reasons that we might be overly busy? Do we find our importance? Do we find our value? Do we find our self-worth in our full schedules? Do we work extra hours to demonstrate company loyalty, also known as job security? Do we say yes to everything because we have FOMO? For those of you that have not checked in with your children or grandchildren, FOMO is fear of missing out. Are we overly busy because we just are afraid of missing out on something? Do we feel intimidated by the idea of slowing down? Some have said this phrase, you've seen it, heard it, read it, I'll rest when I'm in heaven. I'll rest when I'm in heaven. That approach to life is not Christ-like. Why do we want to rest when we're with him in heaven and not now when he modeled rest for us here and now? So the opposite is true. The way of Jesus included margin. The life of Jesus, the example that he set for us, included margin. Mark 4, 35 through 41. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over there to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him, and a furious squall came up And the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Would you raise your hand if you've heard this story before? You've read this story before. And if you're anything like me, perhaps you've heard and read this story as an illustration about the disciples' faith, right? Jesus asks them this question, do you not have faith? But today, I invite you to hear this story, to digest this story as an example of the rhythm and pace 
that Jesus set an example for you and for me. Jesus, now this is the picture right here. Jesus has been preaching all day long from the bow of a borrowed boat, right? And fatigue had kicked in and dusk had approached and he brought his session to a close. It was time to stop. Was it not? It was time to stop. So off they went. And imagine with me the disciples' surprise. The disciples think that Jesus is withdrawing from the crowds. And then all of a sudden they realize, oh, he needs away from us too. I imagine Peter walking up to tell Jesus a story that night. And Jesus politely waves him off and says, not now. Judas wants to talk with Jesus about securing uh, more revenue for the ministry. Jesus says, we'll talk about it later, Judas, James, and John. They start asking Jesus after his preaching and teaching. Can we, Jesus, we want to ask you about our status in the coming kingdom. And Jesus just rolls his eyes. He walks to the back of the boat. He hangs a do not disturb sign. He lays down. And he goes to sleep. Jesus went to the back of the boat, and friends, when he was in the back of the boat, he didn't preach there. He didn't teach there. He didn't heal there. He slept. He rested. Fully human. Tired. Exhausted. You want to hear something really strange? You want to hear something really strange? Studies reveal that the emotional energy required to preach a 30-minute sermon is equivalent to the emotional energy required in an eight-hour workday. Some preacher in the back just said amen. <laughs> it's why I only preach 25 minutes and not 30. But it's also why Sunday afternoons feel like I hit a wall. It's kind of two days packed into one morning. Jesus was fully human. He had been preaching and teaching with the people, and he was tired. Are you tired today? Jesus got tired. By the way, I also think the waves have something to do with this story. Y'all ever sat on a boat? Y'all ever sat on an airplane? You could have five or six cups of coffee as soon as somebody starts that boat and starts going, man, I'm out, right? It just rocks you to sleep. And I love here, the waves got Jesus. They got him. He was, he was sleepy already. And all of a sudden, they're just rocking him to sleep, which I love this story. Jesus showed me this this week as I read it over and over and over again. The waves rocked him to sleep, and then he woke up and put the waves to sleep. Isn't that great? Richard Swenson says that margin, margin is the space that once existed between our load and our limits. Margin is the space between vitality and exhaustion. Which do you want more of in your life, vitality or exhaustion? It is our breathing room, our reserves, our leeway. It is the opposite of overload. When Jesus went to the back of the boat, he was practicing and demonstrating for us margin saying no, walking away, resting. We need to practice margin in our lives. We need to protect it. The back of the boat is a metaphor here. The back of the boat is a symbol of the necessary break from the activity, the constant activity of life. I want to share something with you that I've gleaned from Mark chapter 4 this week. If Jesus needed to stop, so do we. If Jesus needed and did stop. You and I need to stop. His example, his way of life is not a suggestion. We don't read the text and say, Jesus went to the back of the boat and took a nap. That seems like a good idea. If Jesus did it, it's a brilliant idea. We ought to follow his example. He rested. He had margin. If he had to stop, so do we. I am guessing today that a lot of you here are extremely busy 
and you are extremely worn out and you're not even happy. Whatever it is that you're doing and filling and consuming your calendar with, thinking it's going to fulfill you and satisfy you and give you meaning, is not doing so. You're not even happy and you're worn out. <clears throat> I know this guy. He leads a small church down the street. 49 of them, actually. His name's Craig Rochelle. Life Church. Great church. Great man. Great pastor. He said something that did not just step on my toes, but broke my foot. So if you all just slide your feet forward this morning. Um, compliments of Pastor Craig. We're just going to feel our, our, our feet shattered today. He said this, maybe the greatest enemy of the life you want is the life you are living. Maybe the greatest enemy of what you want out of this gift called life is actually the life that you're living. Is it possible that God wants to do something in your life today, but your calendar is too full? Is the busy life you're living costing you? Are you too busy for God? Moving on, let's pivot and talk for a moment about what happens when we're overly busy. We live life in a hurry. I've been traveling all week. We went to Phoenix for a national soccer showcase with our daughter Ellie. At the end of the tournament, we flew Ellie home with a teammate, and Andrea and I flew on for a vacation to celebrate our 20 years of marriage. Give Andrea Barnett a hand. Give Andrea. <laughs> Give Andrea Barnett a hand. So on this trip, I checked in online. So we didn't have to wait in line at the airport. I have TSA pre-check because I don't want to wait in a regular security line. I want the expedited version of security. No amens yet? I purchased seats A1 through A15 for Andrea and Ellie and I. Yes, I included my family wasn't just for me. Why? So we could get off the plane faster. I'm, 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 I'm being vulnerable here. I'm a mess. I rented a car. Get this. I rented a car that did not require me to speak with any humans or stand in any line. I got an email. It told me what parking spot it was in, and it said the keys are in the car. I didn't have to wait in line. When we landed, guess what I said? And don't judge me. You've said this too if you've traveled. Don't judge me. You go get the bags, I'll go get the car. <laughs> and you know why? Because you can wait on the bags, I'll go get the car, I'll swing by and pick you up. And we can get out of here faster on our way home. Our flight was delayed an hour and 20 minutes. Guess what I did? I finished this sermon. We have friends in the airport. They're, they're in this service right now. They're in this section. I won't tell you the row. And he texted me, yeah, let's, let's maybe get together, go get some lunch in the airport. And I texted back but I need to finish my sermon on busyness. <laughs> on vacation. And I said, I know. I'm a hypocrite. Busyness on vacation. Oh, so we had a 30-minute layover in Denver. They said, in San Francisco, do you want to rebook your flight to go to Vegas? and then Phoenix, and then Dallas, and get home at 12.25 in the morning in Tulsa. I said, no, I'd rather bang my head on a brick wall. We'll go ahead and go to Den uh, Denver, and we'll take our chances. We get there, we've got a 30-minute layover. And the four of us ran 
from B45 to B53 because I didn't want to be in Denver till 11 p.m. I'm too busy. I have too much going on. All four of us made our flight. I got there a little bit faster because I was in the A group. (laughs) You see the theme on one trip. Hello, my name is Adam Barnett, and I'm addicted to hurry. Walter Adams was a spiritual director for C.S. Lewis, and he said to walk with Jesus is to walk with a slow, unhurried pace. He goes on to say, hurry is the death of prayer. And St. Francis said every one of us needs half an hour of prayer a day, except when we're busy. Then we need an hour. Like many of you, I watched the series, The Chosen. I was thinking about that series this week, and and even went and found this picture that really demonstrates countless scenes that we watch in this, this whole series, right? Where, where Jesus and his disciples, you know what they're doing here? Do you see what they're doing? They're just walking. Does it look like they're in a hurry to get from B45 to B53? No. They're just together. They're just walking. I want to walk with Jesus. I think you do too. But I don't want to walk with Jesus in a way that I'm looking over my shoulder telling him to keep up. But instead, to slow down my life. Friends, Jesus wants to infuse our lives with purpose. And purpose requires us to do things. I get it. Our schedules are going to fill up with good things, important things, necessary things, wholesome things. Jesus wants you to have purpose, but he doesn't see it through full schedules and hurried lives. So if busyness and hurry are in the way of your spiritual life, if busyness and hurry are in the way of you finding, discovering, living, cherishing the life that Jesus wants from you, please slow down and catch up with God. Just slow down your life in order to catch up with him. There's a legendary pianist who was once asked the question, how do you handle all these notes the way that you do? And the artist responded, I handle the notes no better than anyone, but the pauses, the pauses, that is where the art resides. Do you need to pause? Do you need a healthier rhythm? Have you been living life thinking you'll rest one day in heaven? That's not Christ-like. That's not the life Jesus wants for you. So let me finish by offering a few practical tips that might help you practice slowing down. Practice margin. Practice rest. First, schedule time with God. You schedule everything else in your life. Schedule time. Put, Put time with the Lord in your schedule. And then don't let anything interfere with it. I want you to sink in. Let this sink in. Do you know, and you do, Jesus already sees your tomorrow? You can't, because you and I are bound by time. But Jesus already sees your tomorrow, and he is eager to spend time with you there. He already wants time with you. Tomorrow. Schedule it. Two, learn to say no. I'm not just talking about the things that you don't like doing or the invitations you get that just bore you to death. I'm talking about things that you enjoy, things that are in your schedule each and every week. Learn to say no. Three, quit something. Bob Goff is an author that I love. I read all of his books. He admits that he cannot say no to anything. He says yes to everything. And his phone number's in the back of one of his books. You should call him and invite him to your birthday. He'll probably show up. He can't, he can't say no. Bob admits to quitting something every Thursday. It's like, I say, I say yes to so many things, I gotta say no once a week to something. So say no to something. Quit something. Don't quit something important. Don't quit on a person. Don't quit on your children or your job or your bills. Don't, don't quit on anything crazy and then blame the preaching team at Redeemer. 
But quit something that you don't have to do that's time-consuming. Four, adopt new disciplines. Here's, here's, here's a crazy idea. Come to a full stop at a stop sign. There's the elbowing. It's all right. Another one, go the speed limit. It's a crazy idea. You know, not too long ago, my, my parents were in town, and we were like, let's get a pizza at Mazio's. And I remembered this series we did two years ago called Unhurry and Adopting New Rhythms and Paces. Thank you for that book, by the way. And, and, and I looked at my dad and I said the stupidest thing I've ever said. Dad, instead of ordering a pizza, let's drive to Mazio's and order it ourselves. It's just terrible. I drove to Mazio's and ordered a pizza and I went and sat in a booth and waited. What if we did those kinds of things? to rival our addiction to busyness and hurry. Uh, five, resist social acceptability. You know, just because your friends and just because your friends' kids are doing it, you don't have to do it. You know, just because you were invited to it, you don't have to go. You can resist the social acceptability. We live in a world that's, that's really in a hurry, right? Say no. Turn your notifications off. I preached on technology getting in the way of our spiritual lives a few weeks ago. Go listen to it. Turn, get a healthier relationship with your smartphone. Turn these notifications off. Slow your life down. Lastly, practice Sabbath. We're so busy, we rely on ourselves instead of God's help. You know what? We start to think we're all powerful. We're always on the go. We're never able to slow down. We're never able to stop. We try to be ever-present, all places at all times. We are aware of everything happening at all times. Social media, texting, emailing, phone calls, snapping, whatever else you do on your phones, we're always aware of it. We start to think we're all knowing. Practicing Sabbath is beneficial for so many reasons, and here is one of them. God is omnipotent, God is omnipresent, God is omniscient, and not us. And Sabbath reminds us of that. Let's pray. Jesus, the danger that we are in is not that we will renounce our faith in you. It is that we will become so distracted, so rushed, so preoccupied that we might settle for a mediocre version of the life that you want for us. Skimming our lives instead of living them the full thank you for walking to the back of a boat so long ago thank you for laying your head down thank you for going to sleep that day and letting us read about it and learn from it and hopefully adopt a similar way of life where our busyness and our hurry do not get in the way of you and us. Amen.